Good morning, church family. We're so glad you're here. And we also welcome those who are on live stream. If you're here in person, please remember to tear off the little tab. Put your name on it and put it in the offering plate. Uh, if you are going to uh, put a prayer request on the back, please let us know if that is to be shared or if that's for pastor only. Instead of school supplies this year, we are asking that if you would, the, the mission board is asking if this seems like something you would like to do to please give to the Bob Foling Memorial Fund. These funds will go to the um, leadership development uh, group of young men in Rantoul that Herb Burnett works with, and it's for uh, crafts. So um, if you do that, please either mark your envelope for Bob Foling Memorial Fund or uh, write it on the little memo line of your check. Band of Sisters will meet this week, no, August 30th. And they're going to pack uh, sewing kits for the Operation Christmas Child. I asked this morning, they told me needles, thread, uh, seam rippers, um, what else did she tell me? Uh, pens, straight pens, safety pens, uh, and these will all be packed in the little uh, soap boxes that you can put in your suitcase, the, about that size. So anything that's sewing that's about that size, uh, they would love to have so that they can pack it. Uh, on the 30th. Just bring it to the church and put it in the OCC box, which is on the north side of the fellowship hall. Uh, if you pay attention, last week there was like 900 and some dollars for the, uh, uh, the baby bottle for living alternatives. This week, it's $1,279.17. So, up, up, up it goes, and thank you very much. Uh, the last announcement I have is due to the um, Labor Day weekend. Men and women's prayer breakfast will not be till September the 9th, 8 a.m. Uh, I am still receiving compliments or little stories, something like that, about Bible school. And I want you to know, it thrills my heart. Um, this is my object lesson for this morning. This little guy's called Cosmo, and the kids get one of these every day. Uh, he's a star, and on the bottom is their memory verse for the day. He might be small, but the memory verse is there. Jesus said, I am the light of the world. Now, Cosmo will shine if you put him in the light. The more time in the light, the brighter he shines, right? That's my object lesson for today, and I don't have to. I don't think I have to explain it to you. The more time in the light, or the brighter you shine. Shine for Jesus. Amen. Our worship call, or call to worship, this morning is from Isaiah chapter 40, verses 28 to 31. In this passage, it speaks to us of the fact that we need to turn to God in our time of need and he will be there to help us. Have you never heard? Have you never understood? The Lord is the everlasting God and creator of all the earth. 
He never grows weary or weak. No one can measure the depths of his understanding. He gives power to the weak, and he gives strength to the powerless. Even youths will become weak and tired, and young men will fall in exhaustion. But those who trust in the Lord will find new strength. They will soar high on wings like eagles. They will run and not grow weary. They will walk and not faint. Let's pray. Lord God, we just give you praise that no one can compare with you. You give us power. We live in your power. We can access your power and your strength. The grass may wither and die, but your word, Lord, stands forever. You are faithful to all generations, and we praise you for that. Be here in our midst this morning, Lord. Hear our praises and our prayers, and help us to Open our hearts and our minds and give Pastor Lord the words to speak to our hearts. In Jesus' name, amen. Okay, the, will the praise team please come and we will lift our voices to the Lord. Stand if you are able.
our holy, holy, holy Lord Jesus, our Savior and Lord and King, we give you praise and honor this morning as we again recognize and hail to you the glory for your wonderful ransom that you have paid on our behalf, helping us, Lord, be freed from sin and death, helping us stand before you, Holy Father, as cleansed by the blood of Jesus Christ. We give you praise and thanks, Lord God, for these amazing, amazing miracles, Lord, that you have pro provided to each and every one of us. Father, we pray that you will help us now turn our hearts to look at you, to hear you, to obey you, to live for you every day. Guide us through the service to help us know what it is you're calling of us and expecting of us. And we ask it in Jesus' name. Amen. God bless you. You may be seated while the ushers come forward to take our morning offering. Shall we pray? Heavenly Father, we come to you this morning worshiping you, expressing our love for you, and accepting your love for us. God, in response to all you do for us, all your love for us, we give back a portion of what you've given us, and it's our way of saying thank you. God, we ask that you use these tithes, these offerings, these gifts to the furtherance of your kingdom. I pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. So, last few weeks I have been encouraging you that uh, if you've made the agreement that you wanted to share your story with other people, that please do so. And then I've been saying the last few weeks that uh, I would love to have you come up and share with the rest of us the, the story that you experienced and the, the blessing you got, you got out of it. And so when Wednesday this morning was saying, you remember when you said you wanted us to share? And I had an absolute brain fog. I thought, what is she talking about? I want you to share what? And so she explained to me that I've been inviting people to get up and share their story of telling others about Jesus and what God's done in their life. And so Wednesday's going to do this now. And Ron, I'm giving you just 30 seconds warning. She's going to go up to mic six and use mic number six. So this last weekend, I wasn't here at church uh, because I had an opportunity um, to have a weekend with just me and my dad. Um, and we went to Chicago, and we just enjoyed some time together. Now, I call him my dad. He is not my dad. He is my stepdad. Um, my biological dad um, is a pedophile and he has done jail time. Um, so what led to this is having time with my stepdad 
and sharing my story with him. Because he kind of knew some things um, because my mom, you know, would share. Because he's going through a dark time right now himself. Um, with my mom passing, they were married for 25 years. Um, and she passed away from ovarian cancer. And she fought a hard battle, um, five years fighting. And he was with her every step of the way. Um, and right now, he's, he's mourning. Um, he's not really sure what to do. He's a man of faith. Um, but he finds that he's not praying at his meals. He goes to church, but he feels like he's just going through the motions. Um, so while I was sharing with my dad, I said, you know, God puts us through dark times. Um, and the reason why my biological dad is a pedophile is because me and my sister were his victims. And during that time, it was very dark. But I look back now, and I see God with me every step of the way. Um, and I know that there are times where God says, you have to go through this, but I'm with you every step of the way. And I shared that with my dad. I said, you know, God put you through this, and he's going to be with you every step of the way. Um, and I feel like that brought us even closer. Um, so we now are making this our annual trip um, because having time with my dad was never something I wanted. Um, and so now I get this opportunity and my stepdad rejoices in that, um, giving me those opportunities to, you know, have time with my dad and being able to help him through his pain and his sorrow and his darkness right now. So just know that if you're going through a dark time that you're to go through it, but it's, it's going to make you that much stronger and that much better. Um, and because my, moment, my mom was a woman of faith, um, I am that much stronger. So, thank you. Thank you. It's never easy to, <clears throat> to share your story, especially uh, when the story isn't a pretty one. So thank you, Wednesday, for being vulnerable and sharing. And I trust that helped your stepdad and it will help others here, uh, either in person or on the website, who may be carrying similar burdens. It's a great privilege to be able to share your story of what God's done in your life. And as Wendy's indicated, it doesn't have to be someone that you're leading to the Lord. It may be someone you're leading back to the Lord, someone who's going through difficulties. And the, the struggles you've had may be just exactly what they need at this point in their time to help them draw closer to God. So if you haven't been out there watching, listening for opportunities to share with others what God is doing in your life, please do so. Start being sensitive to the, the spiritual, emotional needs of those around you. And when God gives you an opportunity, maybe then you can share what God's done with you and give them a reason for hope because of the hope you have. Thank you, Wednesday. As a pastor, I, I try to be inspirational. I, I try to help people become stronger in their faith. I, I try to be a good example. Um, I, I try to show people what it means to, to follow God. Sometimes I do a pretty good job of that. Sometimes I absolutely fall on my face. So what I'm about to share is one of the fall on my face Moments. It was not a banner day for young Pastor DeWitt. I was associate pastor of a church in Kansas. 
and we were taking two van loads of youth on a mission trip up into uh, Montana to a, a reservation up there. We were doing some work on a mission church, and it was a great trip, wonderful time. Another guy was driving the lead van. I was driving the, the follow van. And you have to understand, this was way before cell phones. You remember those days, right? So we had the two vans out on the, the interstate going along, and the other van got a little bit further ahead of me, and somebody in the back of my van said they needed to go to the bathroom badly. Flashing my headlights didn't work. No cell phone. We had a, a CB radio, but it long since stopped working. He wasn't answering or couldn't hear me, whatever. And so out of a moment of desperation, we found an exit off the interstate. I went and had a, a mercy stop and came back on the interstate having no idea where the lead van was. Did he even know I was gone? So I decided to stretch the speed limit just a little Quite a little, actually. <laughs> Almost 20 miles an hour over the speed limit. Okay. And I got eventually got the attended, attention of a sheriff's officer. <laughs> Imagine the scene. Church van. Pulled over. Lights flashing. Twelve kids in the youth group laughing at the youth pastor who's getting a ticket. And then the other van pulls up too. So now there's 30 people laughing at the youth pastor who, who was doing his best to, to give a, a good representation of what it means to follow God, right? And, and so this was not a banner day. I broke the rules. I got caught. I had to pay the fine. We've all broken the rules. Maybe you haven't gone 20 miles an hour over the speed limit. Maybe you accidentally or on purpose rolled through a stop sign or a stop light. Maybe you went through an orange light that was rapidly becoming red. Maybe you, you pulled into a parking spot where it wasn't a parking spot, at least not for you. Maybe you didn't report that income that you actually made, but you decided, well, if I report that, I've got to pay more taxes, so I'm just not going to list that. Who would know? There's all kinds of ways that we can break the rules. We've all done it. Some of us have gotten caught. Some of us have not gotten caught. Some of us had to pay the price for our indiscretion. Some of us got away with it, at least on the outside. This morning we're going to talk about a passage from Luke chapter 13. I believe it's verse 24 where Jesus talks about what happens to those who break the rules, those who get caught by God, and those who have to pay the price. Jesus is going to give what I consider a very harsh warning. And we need to hear this warning. I, I am not by nature... A, a doom and gloom pulpit pounding. I don't even have a pulpit here in front of me, so I can't pound it. I, I, I'm not a fire and brimstone type of preacher. I, I, I really love the grace and mercy of God. I don't really like talking about judgment. I don't really like talking about hellfire. I don't like talking about condemnation, but, but there's something that the Bible talks about. And as I've made a commitment to work my way through the, the teachings of Jesus... I have to realize there were times when Jesus talked about judgment. There were times, times that Jesus talked about getting caught and paying the price. And when it comes to the paying the price for our spiritual rule breaking, 
our spiritual sins, our rebellion against God, if you will. When it comes to the, the warnings that Jesus gives, they are harsh warning because unlike the, the fine I paid in Montana many years ago, it wasn't that much. It wasn't that far long ago that they didn't have a speed limit up there. So I didn't have to pay a big fine, but it was embarrassing all the same. The, the cost of disobedience and rebellion against God is not a small fine. It's not a temporary inconvenience. As we read, it's eternal damnation. Not a story I like to hear. But it's something that Jesus talked about. It's something we need to be reminded of. Let's look at Luke chapter 13. We're going to pick up in verse 24 where a passage I actually talked about a couple of weeks ago. And I'm not going to go back and redo everything I said last week or two weeks ago. If you didn't hear it, go onto our website or onto our Facebook. You can listen to the sermon and hear the things I said about it. But I'm going to pick up where I had already read. We're going to go forward from there. Starting with verse 24, Jesus is talking. And he says, work hard to enter the narrow door to God's kingdom. For many will try to enter, but will fail. When the master of the house has locked the door, it will be too late. You will stand outside knocking and pleading, Lord, open the door for us. But he will reply, I don't know you or where you came from. Then you will say, but we ate and drank with you and you taught in our streets. And he will reply, I tell you, I don't know you or where you come from. Get away from me, all you who do evil. There will be weeping and gnashing of teeth. For you will see Abraham, Isaac, Jacob, and all the prophets in the kingdom of God. But you will be thrown out. And people will come from all over the world, from east and west and north and south, to take their places in the kingdom of God. And note this, some who seem least important now will be the greatest then, and some who are the greatest now will be the least important then. Work hard to enter into the kingdom of God. We talked about that a couple of weeks ago, and I, I said that I don't understand this as a, a new teaching that Jesus says we need to somehow work our way into salvation. I understand Jesus saying we need to take seriously our relationship with God. We need to take seriously the, the fact that we need to come to God in faith and repent of our sins and commit our lives to him. We need to, to make that a focus, uh, something we will really take. We, we shouldn't take God's mercy and God's grace for granted. And he, he's really, I almost missed it when I was reading through this passage. I, I, I wanted to jump straight to the weeping and gnashing of teeth aspect of it. So, so I almost missed it in several verses Verse 25, he says, I don't know you. Verse 27, he says, I don't know you. Get away from me. In verse 28, he says, you will be thrown out. So I almost missed this pronoun, you. And when I eventually thought about it, I thought, who is he talking about here? When he says, I don't know you. Who does he mean? When he says, you will be thrown out, who's he talking to? When, when he's using this pronoun, when he says, he didn't use the pronoun, but get away from me, who is Jesus talking to? Or in the parable, who's God talking to? When he says, you will be thrown out, get away from me, I don't know you. I had no answer to that question. I had to go back and look. Who is Jesus talking to in Luke chapter 13? And if you go back to the beginning of Luke chapter 13, Jesus is in the synagogue. And in verse 10, one day he was teaching in the synagogue. And, and those of us who've been to church for a while understand that the synagogue was kind of back then the equivalent of our, our church building. 
there were a lot of different synagogues and, and a lot of different towns. This is where uh, the, the Jewish faithful met for, for, for sermons, if you will, where a, a rabbi or a religious leader would, would tell people about God's word and explain what we should do about it. It, it basically was an opportunity for worship. So Jesus was in what we would call church. They called it synagogue. There, and Jesus had been uh, healing somebody on the Sabbath, which technically from their viewpoint is a disobedience to the law. And so one of the synagogue rulers, who we would call maybe a pastor or a deacon or an elder or chairman of the board or whatever, one of the religious leaders confronted Jesus. And then Jesus started talking to the religious leader and sharing all kinds of stuff. And then later, someone else asked him a question about theology. Again, I assume this is one of the religious leaders who said, how many people are going to make it to heaven? So when, when I asked the question, who is Jesus talking to? My assumption is Jesus is talking to some religious people, right? These are people in what we would call church. These are perhaps church leaders. These are people who had given a lot of time and energy, perhaps invested lots of money in following God as best they know how, at least going through the rituals, the religious rituals, and doing the, the religious things like, like we might do. You, you come to Sunday school, if you're really super religious, you come to Sunday school. If you're only kind of religious, you don't come to Sunday school, you just come to worship service. I'm kidding. I really am. I, I'm not condemning you for not going to Sunday school. But you get the point. But we, we view those who do all this religious stuff as being way more holy than the rest of us, normal people who, who just come to church, or, or we, we might even look down our nose further at people who don't come to church, they just sit at home, turn on the television, and worship from there. Well, they're not obviously nearly not as spiritual as the rest of us. My apologies to those who are worshiping from home. We're glad to have you with us. Thank you for joining us. I'm, I'm just being mouthy right now. But that's the way we feel about it, right? The more religious stuff you do, the more you sing with the, the praise team, or, or maybe uh, the people back in the sound booth, thank you for, for doing it. Uh, we couldn't do this with, very well without them helping with the sound. And if, if anybody wants to be religious and help them with the sound booth, we could use some help back there. The more religious stuff you do, the better you are, right? The, holy, the more holy you are, the more righteous you are. Of course, if you do all of that stuff, you're on the deacon or a deaconess, you're on the board, you, you teach Sunday school, you, you help in the sound booth, you get up front, you sing with the praise team, or you play the piano or drums, or maybe you, you get up and share your testimony, or, or you get up and preach. Those who do those things are, are way above the rest of us. But yet it's to those people Jesus gives these comments. Now, I don't know you. Get away from me. You will be thrown out. Wow. That really hits home when you stop to think about it. To think that maybe... Jesus is giving warnings to those of us here in the church. Words of warning. Yeah, and, and specifically what he's talking about, this is the part I wanted to jump to at first, but I, I had to go back and deal with who you is that Jesus is talking to. You is us. Those of us who are here. Those of us who who bothered coming to church. God is talking through Jesus, giving a harsh warning that maybe, just maybe, being here isn't enough. Maybe, just maybe, doing religious stuff isn't what 
God wants of us. Maybe, just maybe, I'm not okay because my parents were okay. Or my spouse was okay. Or I, I gave a lot of money or, or, or whatever. Maybe God wants something else. Maybe God wants something more from us than just coming and just doing religious stuff and just being here listening to this sermon that's going on and on and then trying to make us feel guilty or afraid or scared. I think about what Jesus said about the weeping and gnashing of teeth and that reminds me of what he said over in Matthew chapter 13 instead of Luke chapter 13, Matthew chapter 13. Uh, when Jesus gives warning, he, he was teaching various parables uh, about what God's kingdom is all about. And in verse uh, 41 through 43, Jesus makes something very similar, makes a comment very similar to what he said in, uh, in Luke chapter 13. Jesus said towards the end of time, the Son of Man will send his angels and they will move from his kingdom. That's interesting. They will remove from his kingdom. Everything that causes sin and all who do evil. And the angel will throw them into a fiery furnace where there will be weeping and gnashing of teeth. And he goes on to say, then the righteous will shine in their father's kingdom. So the same kind of thing as what he says in Luke chapter 13 where he says, you people who are doing religious stuff. I never knew you. And, and here he talks about you people who, who think you're in God's kingdom will possibly be thrown out and they'll be weeping and gnashing of teeth. And my, my, my question when I read this kind of stuff is how can we be sure? Is there any way we can know that we will receive God's grace and God's mercy and not, not have to fear for our eternal damnation before God how if those who go to church if those who are leading in church if if the the preachers and the teachers and the deacons and the deaconesses and the chairman of the board and all those people if they can't be sure by just doing that if if the people who get up and sing aren't guaranteed then what chance do we have And I think about that, I, I, my mind goes back to other passages where the Bible talks about these harsh warnings. And I thought about 2 Peter chapter 3. It's a great passage, and, and I encourage you to yeah, either turn there now. It's on, this Bible is on page 971. Or read it later on. It talks about lots of stuff we could get uh, distracted on. But in 2 Peter chapter 3, uh, verse 9, it says that the, the Lord isn't really slow about his promise, as some people think. No, he's being patient for your sake. He doesn't want anyone to be destroyed, but wants everyone to, what does it say? Repent. Repent. That's what God wants. God's not asking us to do all kinds of religious stuff, although that doesn't hurt. It's good to come to church and, and to be encouraged and to encourage one another. The Bible talks about that too. It's good to, to give tithes and offerings to God. You know, the Bible talks about that as well as a, a way of expressing our, our, our thanks to God. But that's not the point. The point is what he says here at the end of verse 9. God wants everybody to... Repent. God wants us to admit to ourselves, admit to him, and maybe to admit to others. And we've messed up. We've done stuff we know is wrong. And we need to repent, which in my mind means we come to God and say, God, I am so sorry. Not, not the way I used to say I'm sorry when mom had one brother and, uh, by the ear in one hand and me by the ear in the other hand. We've been in the backyard fighting and she says, I want you to apologize. And he, with your teeth gritted, said, I'm sorry. 
That was a meaningless statement at that point in time. I didn't mean a word of it. I wanted to go back and hit him again. And some of us repent to God that way. We say, I'm sorry. Well, we're not sorry. We, we keep doing the same thing. And, and we're, as soon as we get out of church, we're going to go right back to it. And, and next week, it's going to be the same thing again. It's not that we're really seeking to, to change our hearts and to change our direction. What God really wants for us is to say, God, I am so sorry. I'm tired of going this way. I want to change. I want to follow you in your way. What God really wants is for us to repent. And it says God is being slow in his promise. And his promise was about judgment on the world. That, that what he talked about in, in Luke 13, what he's talked about in Matthew 13, about the angels separating people, the good from the bad, and, and, and taking the people into everlasting punishment who have not repented, truly repented, and turned to him in faith. God is being patient for our sake. You ever wonder why God doesn't just wipe out those people that are so annoying? You know, the people you read about in the news, those horrible people, people who hurt others, who hurt thousands of others sometimes. Why doesn't God just snap his finger, stop their heart, turn off the brain, let them fall over and do the world a bit a favor, right? Well, it says here that God doesn't want them to be destroyed. God wants them to be saved, to be repent. Verse 10 goes on, he says, but because God knows everybody will not repent and turn to him in faith. It says the day of the Lord, which is another way of saying the judgment day. The day of the Lord will come as unexpectedly as a thief. Then the heavens will pass away with a terrible noise, and the very elements themselves will disappear in fire, and the earth and everything on it will be found to deserve judgment. Judgment is coming. And he goes on to say, because this has happened, how should we be living our lives? And, and the, the implication and the suggestion, we should do everything we can to follow God in faith and repentance. Just, just like Jesus said back in Luke chapter 13, he said we should work hard to enter the narrow path. We should take seriously our faith with God and, and make sure that our hearts are clean and we've repented of our sins we've turned to him in faith and and God over and over and over again in the Bible gives us words of warning to call us to himself it's kind of a funny place for a, a wet floor sign isn't it you wouldn't expect the, the carpet on the, the stairs to be wet. But why do you put these out, if you ever put one out? Why, why, why do you put this out? You all talk, but you all talk at the same time. So I assume that you said something like, the floor's wet and there's some danger, right? And, and you look at the little picture here, what's this guy doing? Falling. And they don't want you to be like this guy. So they say, be careful, the floor is wet. If you're not careful, you could fall. Now, there's all kinds of interesting warning signs that, that we, we see from time to time. We'll see the, a warning about a, a, a dog. Beware of the dog. I've got a dog that bites. If you come in here, you might get bit. We, we see warnings about deer jumping into the road. Be careful. We know that deer cross here. If you're not careful, a deer may cross. You might hit it. It could even come through the windshield. It could be bad. We see warnings in the, the mountains about rocks will fall. Be careful of falling rocks. And actually, this, this last this, uh, month ago when I was riding through the mountains, I just passed the falling rock sign. It wasn't 10 seconds later I had a loud <laughs> on my helmet. And I go, oh, wow, that was a falling rock that just hit me in the head. Fortunately, it was a small rock. And I had my helmet on. 
We put up warning signs because there is danger ahead. That's why Jesus put up the warning sign in the Bible, in Luke 13. He wants us to understand God takes sin and rebellion seriously. And he wants us to take it seriously too. Not just ignore it and say, ah, well, everybody's doing it. I'll do it too. It's no big deal. No. We, we could be like this guy. And that sin could take us down. We need to take seriously our relationship with God. We need to take seriously the sin and rebellion in our heart and do what it says in 2 Peter 3. Repent. Come to God and say, God, please forgive me. The warnings in the New Testament, the warnings in the Old Testament are not there to scare us. It's there because God wants to warn us that if we don't change, The path ahead of us is going to be terrible. God loves each one of us. God wants us to respond in repentance and love to him and receive his grace and his mercy and his love. But God can't accept our rebellion. God can't accept our sins. If we turn to him in faith, and repentance. God takes the, the holiness of Jesus who sacrificed his life for us and he wraps us with Jesus' holiness. And when Jesus, when God looks at us, he no longer sees those terrible things we've done. He no longer sees that 20 miles an hour speed violation when he looks at me. He sees the holiness of Jesus. And he says, that's my child. No judgment because of Jesus. If you want to talk with me sometime about your relationship with God, if you have questions about what all this means and, and what you need to do, please let me know. We can talk after church today. You can email me, text me, whatever. Be glad to hear what you have, to hear your concerns, to, to share with you how I understand God's message. But take the warnings seriously. Don't wait another day. Let's look to God in prayer. Take a few moments and allow the Holy Spirit to speak to your heart. God, we thank you for loving us. We thank you for doing all you can to welcome us into your presence and to give us your forgiveness. God, help us to take seriously our relationship with you. And if we've been playing religious games and not really coming to you from our hearts. God, forgive us and help us. Help us to do what you're asking, to repent of our sins and turn to you in genuine faith and obedience. I pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. I invite our uh, musicians to come and lead us in our closing song and I invite you to stand as we sing.
let you know that um, next Sunday we're going to have a baptism. Uh, Venus has been coming to church for quite a while. I've been visiting with her, and she says she wants to be baptized, and I said, yes, let's do it. So next Sunday we'll have a baptism. If you've been thinking about being baptized, maybe you haven't been thinking about baptism, but now you are. Let me know, and uh, we'll have the tank filled with water. If someone else would like to be baptized, this would be a great time to make that public statement of your faith in Jesus. All right, let's go to God in our closing prayer and benediction. God, we thank you for your love. We thank you for your patience. Thank you, God, that you are willing to forgive. I thank you for the opportunity to come here, to gather together either in person or electronically, to be encouraged by your word. God, help us to take the encouragement, the, the faith. Help us to take that into our lives and to share that with those around us. I pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. Now receive the benediction of our Lord. May the Lord bless you and protect you. May the Lord cause his face to shine upon you and be gracious to you. May the Lord be good to you and give you his peace. Go in his peace. Amen.